alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahil azimil khabiril muta'ali. Alhamdulillahilladhi la tuhjibuhu zulumatil layali. Alhamdulillahilladhi arsal jibal al-awali. Subhanahu min ilahin azimi yaghfiru al-dhunub wa la yubali. لا إله إلا الله بها نحيا وبها نموت وبها نلقى الله وبها نوالي وأشهد أن عظيمنا وقدوتنا ومولانا قرة عيني محمد ابن عبد الله عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله أرسله كافة للناس بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فبلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله أما بعد If you look at human history and then come to our history as in the history of our nation as in the Muslim nation you will notice that at the early stages of Islam, at the dawn of Islam, there were two main world powers, empires or superpowers. So on the one side was the Roman Empire, and on the other side was the Persian Empire. And both of these empires had reached the zenith of power. So they boasted political stability, military capability, economical prosperity, and an influence that covered much of the globe. And they sandwiched somewhat in between these two was the Arab Peninsula. And the Arab Peninsula was a hot, barren, harsh environment in which a segment of Arab society lived. They were scattered across an endless desert. As a people, they seemed to have nothing going for them. So disunited, uneducated, purposeless lives. And against all these odds, this is the phenomenal part. Against all these odds, so a harsh climate, barren land, limited to no resources, a people insignificant compared to the major civilizations. Like there was no huge army, trained, disciplined, organized, it didn't exist. So against all these odds and challenges, a civilization rose from the Arabs. And pretty soon it extended from Granada in Spain on one side to New Delhi on the other. So I read history, study history, and I try to look for cause and effect reasons, like what happened? And you study civilizations, certain things are prerequisites. So for example, water. You know, water is a very important part of developing a nation, civilization, country, what, uh, whatever you want to call it. Even this, you know, city of ours, Perth, when the, you know, Captain Cook and the rest came, um, they settled here because of the water, you know, by the Swan River, uh, because the land is fertile, it is green, and, and all the rest of it. Important. Yet they had no water. Like inside the Arab Peninsula, one quarter is considered the vacant land because dry, desert, uninhabitable. The Mecca, which is center of life, the Quran describes it, Wadin Ghayridi, Zar, a place unvegetated. So water didn't exist. Then you think, Khalas, no water, maybe they had something else. In Look as you may, you won't find any of the ingredients that will make a civilization. So, 
you know, massive armies didn't exist, disciplined population didn't exist, human capital didn't exist, gold didn't exist, food, nutrition, nourishment. Like uh, the Prophet who's the Prophet of God, you know, there's a hadith about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was uh, in an orchard picking dates from the floor and ate. So food was rare, limited. And yet, out of Norway, the civilization not only survives, within a short few decades, it catches up to the other civilizations. And not only catches up to them, it overtakes them. And not only overtakes them, it flourishes in itself. So tonight, we want to look at that and see how and lessons to draw from that uh, for, our, for our lives. So notice a few things, dear ones. Allah Rabbul Izza intervened in their lives by a prophet. Allah Rabbul Izza didn't intervene with gold. And he could have intervened with gold. Because you saw the prophet Ayyub alayhi salam. You know, he was ill for many years. And then Allah cured him. And then he was bathing. And gold nuggets started to fall from the sky for him. And he collected it. So had Allah Rabbul Izza wanted to, you know, equip them with gold, gold would have rained from the sky. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ Easy. Allah could, but Allah didn't. For the children of Israel, Allah Rabbul Izza opened water. وَإِذْ اسْتَسْقَى مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ فَقُلْ نَضْرِبْ بِعَصَاكَ الْحَجَرْ فَانْفَجَرَتْ مِنْهُ اثْنَتَا عَشْرَتَا عَيْنَا Strike, O Musa, with your staff. Hit the rocks. The rocks gushed out water. What Allah could have done that? Allah Rabbul Izza didn't. Allah Rabbul Izza could have brought food from the heaven for them that, listen, people, you need nourishment. Here's food. Go and do my bidding. Allah Rabbul Izza didn't. And he did it for Banu Israel. Manu was, salwa was, you know, came down from the heavens for them. The only thing Allah Rabbul Izza gave them the intervention was a prophet, a messenger, by definition carrying a message. The message is the deen of Islam. So Allah Rabbul Izzah through the deen did the following. That's what we're unpacking tonight. Allah Rabbul Izzah changed their hearts and changed their minds and changed their conduct. I want to say that again. Allah Rabbul Izzah changed their hearts, changed their minds, and changed their conduct. And then the rest was organic. Like once you embody those changes that Allah sent, you can't help but become successful in this life and in the next. So I'll start with the first one first, with the heart. So when the Rasul was summoned to the office of prophethood, he came to the people with this message. Ya ayyuhal nas, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. O people, make the declaration, make the proclamation that there is none worthy of worship save one mighty Allah and success will be yours. This is a matter of the heart. Like, in your heart of hearts, there should be nothing that you rely on or subservient to, save the one mighty Allah. And this is the utterance of the Rasul. Allah Rabbul Izzah says in the verse, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْ huh? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, those with the correct belief are successful. So the Rasul came in a time where there are 360 idols in the Kaaba to an Arab population. You know, easily offended, sensitive creatures 
swords by the side, tribal and deeply devout to these idols. Khalid ibn al-Walid remembers that my father sacrificed a hundred camels for a single idol. A, a lot of devotion, a lot of love, uh, a lot of reverence, and yet wrong belief. Can you imagine man bowing down to a stone asking help from it? So Allah Rabbul Izzah sent the messenger to correct the belief first. So the Rasul came that declared that there is none worthy of worship. Like, it was a pretty courageous statement to make. You know, for a people with 360 gods, you say none of this is true. There's just one God. And in a time where there's no police protection, difficult time, so you saw Harassment started, abuse started, imprisonment started, torture started, assassination started, execution started. They, they bore the brunt of it. But within the few years and those that kind of accepted Islam, the superstitious hocus pocus of idols disappeared and a true belief of the one mighty God entered the hearts. And dear ones, that did a few things. The first one is it gave access to the normal human being to the majesty of the Creator. For years they were turning to a rock that couldn't do anything. Now they had access to Allah, the Creator of the heavens and earth. And that is a game changer. You know, in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, they fought the Persians. So one of the mighty generals of the Persians was caught, brought to the court of Umar, tied up. So Umar looked at him, you know, yesterday you were on a throne and you had a crown and Persians were big on crowns. You know, the emperor had a crown 92 kilograms of gold. Like the question you should be asking yourself is what type of neck handles 92 kilograms of gold? And no, Persians didn't have big thick necks. It was just suspended off the ceiling just to hover on his head. And so magnificent that if you entered the presence of the emperor, the king, you saw the wow, you fell down and sajda to him. So this was a general with his crown and with his entourage and with his pomp and ceremony and now he's tied up and brought to Umar ibn al-Khattab. So Umar radiallahu anhu asked him, what, what happened? Like, you were all that. So he says what you should have known. He said, when the fight was against between us and you, it was easy. But how do you fight the one in the heavens? Do you understand? Like now Allah's in the equation, we have no power against that. So this simple people latched on to the Creator. And with that came all the treasures of the Creator. So here, first campaign, Badr. How many Muslims? Huh? Three, th mashallah, 313. You were in my khutbah on Friday? So, 313 in Badr. 313. The opposition, a thousand strong. And scholars differ. Scholars differ, but there is a qual to say there was only eight swords amidst the Muslims. They hadn't come for a battle, that come to raid a caravan, you don't need so many weapons, you know. You... So Allah gives the reason of the cause of the success. But you know, they were victorious, uprooted the enemy, won. So Allah Rabbul Izzah says, إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ 
that remember when you called out to your Lord and Allah accepted your call, your pleas, your du'as, and he said, I will help you with a thousand angels coming row after row. So Allah sent them and the Rasul is on battlefield and he says, he is Jibreel dressed for war. And you would think, khalas, you know, Muslim testimony biased, you know, the prophets encouraging them maybe. There were two people standing on a mountain nearby, non-Muslims, you know, waiting for the battle to finish so they could come down, collect the, what's fallen from the swords and this and that. And one of them died. So they asked him, why did your friend die? He said his heart burst. So why did his heart burst? He said, you were out of fear. What fear? He said, we heard the neighing of the horses from the clouds above and saw the sparks of their hooves. So his heart burst. So in, inside the campaign, you would see a person chasing, a, you know, a Muslim chasing an enemy and before he reaches him, the man is slain. And, and another instance, the Sahabi called one person, oh, so and so, come. And he goes, I, I'm not him. I'm, like angels were on battlefield. Do you see that what it did is it gave them first and foremost connection to the one above the heavens and if Allah Rabbul Izzah is on your side everything else will take care of itself so lesson number one here dear ones tonight you will face difficulties and obstacles and challenges and hardships in life uh, keep Allah on your side keep Allah Rabbul Izzah on your side uh, and success is yours First lesson. Second part. Iman did something else as significant if not more. You see, yesterday they were shackled by all types of fears. And I read a beautiful statement recently. It's all the success you want is on the other side of fear. So you yourselves, others, you're stuck in an unhappy job because of fear. You're stuck uh, in, an, in a bad situation because of fear. Fear is what holds people back. And when there's no fear of Allah in the heart, Allah fills it with the fear of everything else. Remember that. If the heart is not filled with the fear of Allah, Allah fills it with the fear of everything else. So you're afraid of sickness, so you take insurance and you become afraid of losing your job. You take job security insurance and you're afraid of your mortgage. You know, so do you understand me? It's a life. You wake up fear, 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 fear. And then superstitions come, you know, you walk under a ladder, oh my God, what happened? I walked under a ladder, let's walk a few times this way. Do you get me? That was their lives. A life filled with fear and superstitions and shackled by false gods and false ideas. And Iman came and released them from it all. And released them from it all. And they became what I call superhuman. Like you look at the Sahaba and the challenges they faced and the obstacles they conquered, a normal human can't do it. Should I give you some examples? Here I'll give you one. This is the battle of Muta. And the Prophet wasallam has sent these people. Uh, the first way, Zayd ibn Haritha and Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and uh, Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Instructions, listen, Zayd is in charge. If he falls, Ja'far will take the reins. If Ja'far falls, Abdullah ibn Rawaha will take the reins. If Abdullah ibn Rawaha falls, then choose a leader from yourselves. They were expecting, uh, is there a way to get the aircon working? I'm happy to pay extra. Khalas, turn the rough, Habibi. Um, it, this is it, huh? No, I had the same problem at Curtin. 
No, that's not the mic. It's, it's the aircon. Like, I'm complaining about the aircon. You're changing my mic. <laughs> Allah bless you. Ustaz Nazim is my teacher. Like, when I was here, he was uh, my maths teacher. And he's also my teacher. Allah bless you all. Yeah. So, uh, so, we had the same problem at Curtin. There was an uh, aircon problem. So, I, I thought Curtin's a bit further away from the river, so a bit cheap. Then we came here and same thing. <laughs> But they're still charging the old hex money and all that stuff. Anyway. Uh, and Jilan's looking at me, no, Sheikh, you're overdressed, you know. Allahu <laughs> <laughs> al Um No, no, but it's not just me. I've got a little young girl there. She's been fanning her face. Like, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking from here. So because of that, I said that. But Allah bless you all, Ya So, uh, point... I have to say this. And then I've got a sister with a blanket. <laughs> no, no, she, uh, she's my student and family. So, so, uh, so uh, Allah bless you all, Ya Rabbi. I used to teach her in the olden days, like she was my student in class. And, um, you know, she used to go to her mom and talk about my sense of humor and how I pick on them in class and stuff. So. It seems like she hasn't, you know, the, the nightmares have started again. The nightmares started again. <laughs> Welcome, young lady. So the second uh, point was, was their fears dissipated? So now, there are certain things you fear. For example, confrontation is something we all fear. And then, different levels of confrontation. War is a scary concept. Allah save one and all, Ya Rabbi. Now, war, if two equals are fighting, is problematic. Now, these Muslims were sent to odds you cannot imagine. Like, the Prophet ﷺ sent a few thousand. And although historians differ, but one sum is that 150,000 came out against them. One sum. And they went there against Arab tribes, but the Roman legions came instead, you know, from Rome. So can you imagine fear like that? Like, imagine you're surrounded by 10 people in, in a dark alley, it's a problem. But these people are facing like a unsurmountable odds. And you would think they would go pale, you know, nervous, shake worry, panic. Um, you won't find it. Like it's as though they didn't know fear existed. You know, this is the second commander, uh, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. So the first one, Zaid, fell. So Ja'far holds the standard and gallops into the enemy. And then he thinks in difficulty the horse might run back. So he jumped off and hamstrung the horse. And then he, the, this is heard on battlefield him saying, Oh Jannah. Like in, so, in battlefield, like you should be scared against odds. Instead, he going, Ya habba al jannati wa qtirabuha. Oh, the beauty and delight of Jannah and how close you are. Like just beyond this, I am in Jannah. Do you understand? Like where he should be scared and nervous. But do you see what Iman does? It made the obstacles of this life nothing. And then he is not the isolated one. So you know how they struck him. His right, uh, his, uh, his right hand got cut, so he held the standard with his left hand. So they cut off his left hand, so he held it like that. And then they stabbed him through. Uh, and as he's falling, the, 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 the standard's about to fall, so they get it and they say, where's Abdullah ibn Rawaha? So Abdullah ibn Rawaha, who was the third commander in charge, he's... Uh, uh, his cousin has just given him a piece of bone with a bit of meat on it, like, here, have a bite. Uh, and he's, he's having this in the standard camp. Um, and for a second he tarried. 
you know, for a second, like he's, you know, and then he says this to himself, and they hear him, Ya nafsu ma laki takrahin al maut. O soul, why are you afraid of death? Illa tuqtali tamuti, hadha hiyadu al maut qad saliti, wa ma tamanayti faqad laqiti. What are you afraid of death? This is what you were seeking, and you know what you desire is just in front of you. Then he tells himself, uh, like, you know, uh, or my soul, unless you know you die here, you will die somewhere else. So go face your destiny. And he galloped into it. And the Prophet وسلم, is narrating the story to the Sahaba uh, in Medina, like miles away. But my point is difficulties like that, where you would, would have thought they would break, it had no effect on them. Why? Because of the power of Iman. So Iman gave them the strength to succumb all types of odds. Uh, and this is just fear, hunger camp. Um, and they, they overcame acute hunger. You know the stories. The Prophet ﷺ uh, is in the battle of Khandaq. And the Sahaba says, I saw, you know, uh, it reached a time, hunger was so bad, that they, everyone was tying rocks on their bellies. Do you know why? They call it gastric bypass these days. You know, where they put a sleeve on the stomach to make it tight. Uh, but they used to put rocks to tie it, so it you know, uh, becomes smaller, shrinks, and then they don't feel hungry. So then they reach the level, like, you know, if you're still working with a rock on your stomach, morale's pretty low. Like, you know, if it was here, it's smoke all time, you know, like... Everyone's, everyone's tired. So, uh, these ones, they started to compare size of rocks. Who's got the biggest rock? And they looked at the Prophet wasallam, three rocks on his blessed stomach because he's that hungry. Yet they're still working. And not only that, you hear this in the ranks, like in the Muslim ranks. Uh, اللهم لولا أنت مهتدينا ولا تصدقنا ولا صلينا فأنزل اللهم السكينة علينا وثبت أقدامنا إلا قينا Oh Allah, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have been guided, we wouldn't know salah and we wouldn't know zakah, so make our feet firm when we meet our enemy and, and support us and strengthen us. Uh, morale is high. But what's, what's their secret? Because it's not food. Nor is it equipment. Nor is it situation like they're not in a cinema, you know, and not a small army. At this stage, Muslims of 1,400 fighting men. 10,000 plus have come against them. You know, annihilation. And in those days, they would come and attack your house and take your women and children and your boys would be their slaves and your women would be their toys. Uh, those days. And, and they can see all that. Like at the verge of annihilation, but their belief and their confidence and their iman and their fearlessness at such a level that it has set them free from the shackles that everyone else is shackled by. So the second outcome of iman is that it sets you free from the chains that shackles all the rest of humankind. Third, and I will race through this is their Iman in Allah Rabbul Izza gave them a higher authority to listen to and obey. So everyone else goes through a difficulty in life. A challenge comes, a situation comes. They don't know how to deal with it. For example, let's look at divorce. Divorce comes. How to divorce? What to do? Who was right? Who was wrong? What's the rules? Do you understand me? You need guidance. So Allah Rabbul Izza sent them guidance. And because of their belief in Allah, there was no longer any issue, you know, if normal laws of men. For example, you look at what's happening in Australia, or in any country for that matter. Um, who, whoever's in difficulty with the law, there's a feeling of dissatisfaction. You know, there's a feeling of unfairness. 
So if the man's, and we were still in the divorce case, if the man's been done wrong by, you know, the laws like this, it supports women, women get this, and the, and, uh, the woman's on the other side, you know, men are like this, and uh, neither side is happy because they don't have a higher power that they have internally submitted to. Yet to their law, to the law that Allah Rabbul Izza sent, there was full submission from their hearts. So not only did they follow the law, they self-regulated with the law. So for example, in our times, uh, imagine you have a speeding issue. I, I have a speeding problem when I, when I drive. Uh, so imagine I, I you know, Maribook Avenue, that's where the cameras are. So <laughs> True, huh? Yeah. Twice. Uh, so, if you're going, uh, say the, the speed of the road is 70, say you're going 80, and you realize, oh my God, I went 80, I, I don't think anyone's going to go to the police station and say, listen, ha Habibi, you know, I went 80 on that road. <laughs> Take a demerit off. Anyone ever done that? I don't think you're going to do it. But when they breach the law of God, you know, the law that this civilization had brought, they would go to the, you know, applier of the law or to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasul, I have made this sin. Uh, how do I get out of it? How do I atone? How do I make amends? And sometimes the consequence would have been a capital punishment. So they go, Ya Rasul, I did this. Do you understand? Um, so it gave them, through their iman, and through the instructions of the Qur'an, a law that they not only followed, but a law that they loved to follow. So they became a society of rules, when everyone else was a society of running away from rules. And that is what creates a successful society, one of the components. And one of the reasons we are in such a mess today is we are not a country, we are, we are not countries of like, you know, uh, Muslim lands, not countries of rules and regulations. We are countries of how to get away from rules and regulations. You ever drive in those countries? You see the traffic. It's not a let's follow the traffic rule. It's like there's a pathway, there's no car on it, I can probably drive on that. So, third point. The next thing that Allah Rabbul Izza did to them, and notice, this is all changing them. Allah didn't change their, their environment. He didn't change any external factors. He just changed them. The next thing, very important, is Allah Rabbul Izza changed their heads, their minds, the way they think their disposition. Can you imagine what life was for an Arab before Islam? Uh, I read the Chronicles. Essentially, it comes down to this, why in women and songs? Like, they drank, uh, well, they tried to make money, and then it was spent on drinking, it was, you know, having friends around, um, and it was spent uh, on songs. They had, you know, song presses used to come and sing and so on. Um, and they spent uh, on, on basic entertainment and no big ambition in life, passing the days waiting to die someday, you know, and hoping it doesn't happen. So Allah Rabbul Izza sent Islam, and through this, Allah gave them purpose. Allah Rabbul Izza gave them purpose. So that every moment became about achieving the purpose which is the rida of the lord and his jannah like you would watch them wake up in the middle of the night and stand in long <coughs> sessions of prayer very productive why because i'm trying to earn the pleasure of god and don't think they used to sleep all day the next day you know i have done the hajjat habibi don't wake me up you know uh, here, a beautiful case of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. The Prophet sallam, Abu Huraira narrates, the Rasul came to the Sahaba and asked, 
Man asbaha minkum al yawma sa'ima. Who amidst you woke up today fasting? Who is fasting today? So Abu Bakr said, I'm fasting. So he said, which one amidst you has gone to a funeral procession today? Like who has helped out another human being and taken part in their funeral procession, you know, with the digging and the burying and all of that. And he said, I have a prophet of Allah. So the Rasul said, Man at'ama minkum al yawma miskina. Which one amidst you has gone, found some poor person and given him food to, to eat, you know, uh, given him sadaqa? So he said, I have a prophet. And then he, the Rasul said, who has visited a sick person today, you know, to see how he is. You know, I have today. And the scholars say this was by the time of duha. Like it was in the morning still. He had already done all these things. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Why is he doing it? In one voice, please. Just a minute. Yeah. All right, the first one, to please Allah. Why? We're not moving on until you all say it. So the first one, to please Allah. Why? To please Allah. And through that gain Jannah. Guys, because guys, I have said I'm not moving on. If I move on, it will be, you know, breaking my word in la yaliq, you know. So everyone say to please Allah. To please Allah. MashaAllah. Uh, so the first one was to please Allah Rabbul Izzah. And through that attain Jannah. And they spent, so, you know, in Islamic history, there's, there's a scholar. One of his books, one of his books is 80 volumes or 800 volumes. Like I, I, get, I get that mix. And they say about him in his biography, he started to think, is it better for me to have bread, chew it, and then drink water, you know, and kind of eat that way? Or should I just get it in flour form and bake it like that? and then just put it in my mouth so I don't have to chew and stuff. Because chewing to him was a waste of time. So I can just process it straight. Do you know what type of person thinks like that? The, the one for whom every second matters. So I told you they became people of purpose, driven to maximize their impact and their productivity in every second. So. They used to look for opportunities, and subhanallah, like, and don't, uh, if I look at any segment of their community, uh, fascinating. So here, Uthman ibn Affan, old man, a khalifa, running a whole state. And there were problems in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, you know, the, the nation has spread from east to west, you know. And you would expect that he's a very busy man, I don't have time, I have to fix the problems of state. You guys do worship, I don't have time. But Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu arda is, you know, statements about him in history. He used to get a slave to hold the Quran for him, the Mus'haf for him at night. He used to read the whole Quran in Salah in one, in one night. And in the morning release the slave that go, you're emancipated, you're free. Do you understand? At old age, like in his 70s. So pro productivity increased. The, the output increased. Um, and through that, you saw them conquer, you know, east and west. Because everyone else was just normal human and these were superhumans. Um, so dear ones, for our time, let me just, uh, end here and summarize for you, inshallah ta'ala. All the characteristics of success are internal, are intrinsic. They're inside of you. You need to change that. Success is not resources. I looked at a European country that doesn't have access to water. Like as in, it's not, it doesn't have an ocean touching it. 
yet it has the biggest fleet of ships. And you would think, why do you, do you understand me? No ocean, no fleet. And there are nations that have oceans and no fleets. Do you understand? Like if it was based on resources and situations, uh, the ones with the oceans should have had large, big fleets, but no, this one does. You look at a country like Japan, Singapore, very rich, wealthy countries, but almost no resources. They even buy the water from another country. So success doesn't come from resources, nor does it come from climate, nor does it come from opportunities and situations. And success comes from inside of you. And it comes with the following. The first one, Iman. Work on your Iman, develop that. A mu'min can do what a non-believer can't ever do. Like just the fact that you can fast from morning till night in itself is a miracle. And we have little kids doing it. So increase, the stronger your Iman becomes, the more active, proactive, productive individual you'll become. Number one. Through that Iman, build a strong connection with Allah Rabbul Izzah. Because trust me, if Allah helps you, no one can overcome you. And if Allah forsakes you, there is none to hold your hands after that. And history is filled with examples of, of great men, great men, who, in, whose, in whose side Allah Rabbul Izzah was. You know, if I start from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one day sitting under a tree. He's hanging his sword off the tree. A man came, disbeliever, took the sword, put it on the neck of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And swords are like blades, you know, it's just a cut, it will, it, will, it will cut the jugular veins off, you know. So he puts the sword on his neck and says, who will save you from me today? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, without thinking to Allah, so the man's hand froze, it started to shake, the sword fell. So the Rasul took the sword, put it on his neck, says, who will save you from me today? Because I have an Allah and you don't have an Allah. Do you understand? So if Allah Rabbul Izzah is on your court, on your side, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, the moving down from uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, uh, the Prophet to the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, one of the, you know, I told you about the general that they had tied up from the Romans and they brought to Umar, uh, from the Persians, they brought him to Umar. So they came looking for Umar, you know, where, where's, where's, where's the Khalif of the Muslims? Because he's expecting there will be a royal court, there will be guards, um, you know, they will uh, pat you down to make sure you don't have any weapons, then there will be a clearance, then you'll go, you'll sit in so many yards away from the Khalifa, and with his finger, he will motion this way. He's expecting that. So he comes, you know where they found Omar, the head of, this, of, of the Muslim world. Some of the kids in, in the streets of Medina, they go, where is Omar? He, you know, he goes, he goes sleeping there under the tree next to the masjid. So he came, saw him, and they sit uh, a little away so just, you know, the man can, can sleep because you don't want to wake a person up sleeping. Uh, but the man is fascinated, so under his breath he says, uh, you believed and did justice and people were satisfied so you were safe so you could sleep. Do you understand? That and he is happy, Allah, first of all, Allah is with me, nothing can harm me. Secondly, I have executed the justice of the Lord, everyone is happy with the justice of the Lord, no one has any intent to harm me. Do you understand that when Allah Rabbul Izz is with you, and there are people in our times who have, you know, a hundred thousand dollar beds and can't sleep without sleeping too. Because the head doesn't have the peace that it wants. So have Allah Rabbul Izzah on your side, dear ones. Have a strong relationship with Allah Rabbul Izzah. Um, unshackle yourselves from the fears that shaitan has shackled you with. Uh, because shaitan makes you afraid. He makes you afraid of poverty. He encourages you towards indecency. All those are tricks of shaitan. Uh, release yourselves from it. 
your rizq is with Allah Rabbul Izza. And lastly, follow for your body the physical program of the Rasul and the physical guidance of deen. Like for your bodies, follow the, the rules that Allah Rabbul Izza has set for it. Uh, and including in your interactions with one another. This is what created their society against all odds. And they extended, as I say in my speeches, from Granada in Spain on one side to New Delhi in India on the other. And it wasn't a society like other societies that come. You know, Genghis Khan came and others came uh, ruling by the sword and cutting off necks and making big monuments of skulls. Uh, it was a society, an organization, a nation glowing with faith, glowing with knowledge, glowing with goodness, glowing with khair and barakah. Uh, so may Allah Rabbul Izzah place barakah and goodness and khair and afiyah in your lives and may Allah bless you and your families and Allah make your attendance here a cause of khair for you uh, in this life and in the next for your time and patience. I thank you. May Allah guide and guard you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.